everyone. It's Caitlin from Dunce Fun here. I'm hoping I did this right. If this video goes anything like my last live, I probably won't be able to see any comments, but fingers crossed that I can see when you guys pop up. Um, today I'm going to show you some basic drop spindle techniques. Oh, I can see that Mary's watching. Hello. Okay, good. People are finding it. <laughs> Great. Um, so I'm going to show you some very, very basic tips and tricks to get you started on a drop spindle. Uh, these are just things that I found really helpful when teaching. Um, I've taught someone as young as three years old how to spin, and I've taught someone as old as, I think she was 98, how to spin. So, and everyone in between. Um, so these are just things that I found helpful. Alright, so I have here the very first yarn that I ever spun. And if I ever have the chance, oh, hello, hello. <laughs> oh, and Margie too. <laughs> um, I like to show it off because it lets you know that your first yarn doesn't have to be perfect. It's okay to experiment and make mistakes. I say if you make the mistake two times in a row, it becomes a design element. Uh, anyways, so your yarn doesn't have to be perfect to be beautiful. So I always keep my first skein of yarn um, to show to people. Okay, so types of spindles. This is the spindle that I have. My farmer friend Barb makes these for me. So the weight is at the top. This is called the whorl and the stick is called the shaft. And actually spindles um, date back at least to Neolithic times, which is really cool. Um, so this is called a top whorl spindle because the whorl is at the top. There are also bottom whorl spindles. Um, there are supported spindles, there are kick spindles, um, and then depending on how heavy your weight is will determine the weight that your um, yarn can be made on the spindle. So it's really interesting. They're kind of like when you're when you're purchasing a spindle, I like to play with a bunch of them to see what works best for you. Um, these spindles that Barb makes for me are kind of like that middle of the ground, <laughs> middle of the road weight. So I can do anything from like a DK to, if I really push it, I can get a chunky on there. Um, so these are great. I, I like these. Oh, and plug. These will be in my live sale <laughs> coming up the end of this month. I'll be on Sunday the 25th at 10.30 a.m. Central Time. Okay, so I made up a bat for us. So first thing we do is open it up. Da, 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 da. And then whenever I'm teaching, the first thing I like to have people do is pull it right in half. It gets them over their fear of hurting the fiber. It's just fluff. You can't hurt it. So I'm just going to pull off a handful of wool and just kind of throw in the rest on the floor. So there are a million different ways to spin. This is just how I enjoy teaching. This is um, the method that I found most successful. So you could have a leader yarn attached to this, but why make it complicated? I just kind of fluff out my tail and you see I've got a hook on my spindle. Oh, and the pretty colors. They're all hand painted. <laughs> so I'll just stick the end of my tail into the hook and I'll begin to twirl clockwise. Oh no, I've forgotten how clocks work. Okay, <laughs> begin to twirl, twirl clockwise. And you can see the fiber has grabbed and it's becoming yarn already. So this method is called the park and draft method. Um, so draft is just a fancy word for pull. So I've got my yarn started. I'm just going to add a little bit of twist going clockwise. And now my only rule with spinning, at least for this method, is pinch is important. The pinch tells the twist where it's allowed and where it's not. So I've built up my twist. I can feel it between my fingers and I'm going to park it between my knees. Then one hand will pinch and one hand will pull. Does not matter which is which. I switch often. <laughs> so pinch, a gentle pull, then we'll slide and then pinch again. Then I'll add a little more twist clockwise. Park, pinch, pull, 
slight pinch. And my slide is very gentle. I'm opening up that, that, that pinch as I go. Yay, people are coming on. Hello. <laughs> and th that's really the basic. Um, fiber, especially wool, tends to just want to become yarn. So um, it's a lot of fun. Oh, you'll see. So I've got a little slub here. So if I want, I can leave it and I can get a little bit of texture in my yarn. I don't know about you, but I love texture. Slide, pinch, twist. So when I do my twist, I like to roll it down my fingers. I know people that will roll it up their leg. So you just gotta kind of find what works for you. Pinch, pull, slide, and pinch. And you see that twist just kind of shimmies its way up. So now I'm reaching kind of above my head. It gets a little uncomfortable. So keeping my yarn at tension, I like to come down. I've got these nice little notches in these spindles. So I come down this notch and then I just kind of twirl it on like spaghetti. So I'm just twirling. Leave a little bit of um, slack so you can get back up and around your hook and you're ready to keep spinning. Pull, slide, and pinch. Pull, slide, and pinch. Add some more twist. Now, you'll kind of get a feel of how much twist to be adding um, just by practicing. If you know that you want to apply it multiple times, like a three ply or even a four ply, you're going to need a lot more twist than if you're going to have a single or if you're going to have just a two ply yarn. So you kind of have to think about that a little bit ahead of time. Adding some twist again, but otherwise it just comes with practice. Pinch, pull, slide, pinch. Again, I'm kind of getting above my head, so I'll come keeping it at tension. And I've unhooked it and then I just twirl it on. Up and around. Now eventually you might or you get really excited and you try to spin without parking and then poof it drops. It's called a drop spindle for a reason. It's gonna happen even to the best of us. So it's not the end of the world. You just kind of fluff out your tail, fluff out the tail. And I like to overlap and pinch where my overlap has, has become a join. And then I'll let that twist just kind of jump. And it's really neat to see the little scales of the wool just kind of grab hold of each other. And always add just a little extra twist wherever there's a join. So that twist is what's going to hold everything together. You also notice I'm really gentle with my pull. I'm not squeezing my fiber. I'm not felting it as I'm spinning. I get a lot of people when they're first learning who like to pet their wool as they're spinning, which I know it's fun and fluffy and fuzzy, but we don't want to pet our wool so much while we spin because that's how we felt it. And it makes it a lot more difficult to do our drafting. I'll show you that join again. So let's pretend I've run out or it dropped. Just fluff open the tail, fluff open the tail, and then I overlap and pinch. Then I'm gonna let the twist jump and add a little bit extra. And then I'm ready to keep spinning. Now that join is kind of a weaker spot in your yarn. So the faster you can get it wound onto your shaft, the better. So I'm going to go ahead and wind it on. Add some more twist. Pull, slide, pinch. Ah! See, and that's why they call it a drop spindle. <laughs> I got distracted trying to read a comment. <laughs> Pull, slide, pinch. Add some twist. 
So eventually you'll be able to do it all in one fluid motion. You'll add your twist, you'll pull and slide, add some more twist, and you'll be able to keep going. I like to spin, well, when the world was open, I'd go to Renaissance festivals and I'd spin while I was walking around dressed as a fairy, or I would, um, waiting in line at the coffee shop, I'd pull out my drop spindle. What makes the spindle spin? Yeah, just the, the weight of the whirl and, and gravity, really. Because um, I'm just giving it a good flick and it'll start to spin. You do have to watch it because um, it will try and spin backwards on you if you're not careful. Um, troubleshooting. If you accidentally add too much twist and you get, you can see these coils. See how it's kind of telephone? coils on there. You have a couple options. You can let it untwist a little bit. I don't prefer that method. What I prefer to do is stop adding twist and just do a few pinches and pulls. So I'll pull, slide, and pinch, pull, slide, and pinch. And that twist has shimmied its way up and kind of evened out. So now we don't have those coils on top of each other, which is really nice. For newbies, best weight. You know, um, it's really just personal preference. Um, I would personally pick something that's kind of the middle of the road because then you have options. Because um, you never know when you're starting to spin, are you going to be a really thin spinner? Are you going to just naturally be a chunkier yarn spinner? Uh, everybody's different. So something that's kind of in the middle is really nice because it gives you a chance to experiment. Um, your yarn size changes depending on how much wool you leave after your draft. So if I were to pull it really, really thin, then my yarn would become really, really thin. Add some more twist. We could go even skinnier than that. So you can see, so we can get really pretty thin on this one. And then if I wanted my yarn to be a little bit chunkier, then I leave more wool in between my pulls. Kind of got a thick and thin going on. Now I will warn you, twist is very lazy. It likes to hang out in the path of least resistance. So if you have a thick and thin yarn happening, um, the twist will try and accumulate in the thinner part of your yarn and it'll kind of avoid the thicker part. Thicker yarn takes less twist, skinnier yarn takes more twist. So, pinch, pull, slide. And when you're first learning, I really recommend parking. So breaking down every individual step because your hands are going to be a little clumsy at first. So twist, park, pinch, pull, slide, pinch, pull, slide, pinch. If you're having trouble pulling your wool, there are a couple different options that could be happening, uh, reasons that could be happening. One is your hands might be too close together. I'll pull out a different piece of wool really quick. So a fancy word for how long your fiber is is called staple length. So you can see if I keep my hands far apart and I pull, it's very easy for that fiber to pull apart. But if my hands are close together, it's not going to go anywhere. And that's because I'm holding on to two ends of the same fiber. Um, so if I'm holding on to two ends of the same fiber, nothing's going to happen. But if I hold on to an end of this fiber and an end of this fiber, they're just going to slide right past each other. And that's how drafting happens. Um, so you might, your hands might be too close together. Uh, your fiber might be a little bit sticky. Um, that happens after dyeing or if it's sat in your closet for a little while, it might start to felt. Um, you might be felting it accidentally by petting your fiber too much while you're spinning. Um, and I think those are the, that I found the main reasons. 
why it might be difficult to draft your fiber. If you're still having trouble, what you can do is pre-draft your fiber. So before I even pick up my spindle, I would take all of my fiber and I would prep it just by loosening everything up just a little bit. So that way when I go to spin, I'm not having to work quite as hard. I'm not having to remember to draft or kind of fuss with those areas that are a little bit too sticky. So you can see, you can, you can draft it out a little bit so that when you go to spin, you're not having that extra step. Making sure I'm not missing any comments. So that's pre-drafting. I'm trying to cram a lot in here. Um, let me know if you have anything else you wanna see in particular trying to pay attention to those comments or if you have any questions. Um, let's talk about plying for a minute. So after you, you've spun up all of your yarn, um, there are a lot of different ways to ply also. I'm just going to talk about two of my favorite ways. Um, one is called Navajo ply and one is just a regular two ply from a center pull ball. So you would wind off your yarn from your spindle. Make sure everything's at tension because you can see um, it's pretty curly if you loosen that tension because we've got all of this twist going in one direction. So when we ply, we relax that twist by going in the opposite direction and resting it on another piece of yarn. So I've got some samples of a uh, two ply yarn. Ply on the fly. <laughs> so this is um, a a fleece bat that I spun up and this is just a two ply yarn so pretty basic but the fiber makes it really fun and textured um, this is another two ply but I call it a bubble ply so I first spun a single from my bat and then I took a gold thread and I plied it with the thread and that's how I got this fun kind of bubbly texture. And then the Navajo ply I want to show you is a three ply yarn. And this is humongous because um, it's actually, I call it neck garland. I wear it as a necklace. But this is my three ply yarn and it's kind of like a chain. Is how you can see there's three strands of yarn coming together to make the one. Oops, some sequins too. <laughs> Anyways, um, I did, I did pre-spin up a single so we can play with plying, but I, oh, I did bring it. I'm so prepared. Okay, so I've got it right here. I'm just going to grab another spindle. Um, so I went ahead and pre-spun my single and then I wound it on a ball winder. So now I can pull from both the outside of the ball and from the center. And for two ply, I'm just going to tie a little knot. Again, you can have a leader yarn. There are so many ways to do this. This is just um, one way that I found really simple for teaching. I'm going to stick that knot on the hook. And because we spun clockwise for our single, we're going to spin counterclockwise for our ply. So just gonna give it a little bit of twist. And plying takes a lot less twist than doing your singles. Already got a little knot, <laughs> but you can see there's my two ply right there. And when you're first learning, I really recommend every few inches or so to just let it relax and make sure you're not completely twirling up on itself. Check the balance of the yarn. And just a little more twist. You can check on it again. That's a pretty balanced yarn. And once again, just like our singles come down onto the shaft. So two ply is pretty simple and I what I really love about plying from a center pull ball is you're not having to weigh one skein of yarn out and then hope at the end that you mat you match up. Um, it's always annoying when you have just like a little bit left from this other skein. Uh, so plying from a center pull ball you use everything there's no waste. Um, everything just lines up at the end. 
So that was a simple two ply. We have just a few more minutes, so I want to show you this Navajo ply. Cut this off. Okay. So, oh, I've made a mess. That's why I brought scissors, so I wasn't trying to untangle things the whole time. All right, so when I Navajo ply, I just make a little loop first. So I just make an overhand knot. It's the easiest way to get a tiny little loop, just big enough that you can get two fingers through it. So I'm going to stick that loop on my hook. And if you know how to crochet, this is great. If you don't know how to crochet, it's still really easy. <laughs> you're just doing a chain stitch. So you're going to pull your working yarn through your loop. And so I've got one, two strands here. Then from here, I'm going to pull up the third strand and let them meet. And I've still got a finger through that loop. Add a little bit of twist counterclockwise. And then because my fingers are still through the loop, I pull the next one through. Pull up. So that's one, two. And then pull a working yarn up. Three. Add just a little bit of twist. And again, you can check to make sure you're balanced. But here's that three ply yarn. So it makes it a little bit chunkier, but you do lose some yardage by doing three ply as opposed to two ply. So let's wind it on down here, switch hands. <laughs> and I really encourage you when you're first learning or playing to experiment, to try which hand feels more comfortable with the drafting and which hand is more comfortable if you're doing your plies, um, holding on to your working yarn and so on. It's just fluff, you can't hurt it. You might as well play. It's supposed to be fun and relaxing, right? Add a little bit of twist. Go through my loop. Pull up the next loop. So one, two strands, and then your working yarn is your third. Add a little twist. Then I'll wind it on. Does anybody have any questions or comments? I think this uh, three ply might be one of my favorite ways to ply in a drop spindle. You do lose some yardage, but I just think that yarn is, ends up so pretty, the twist. And you want to make sure that when you're doing your three ply yarn, that the three strands come together at the same time. Um, if you have your two strands meeting up before your third, and what you end up with um, is just two strands that are plied and then a third one that's wrapping around them, uh, which can be a cool look if that's what you're going for. But if you want a true three ply, you want all three to meet at the same time. There we go. So that's pretty much what I had for you guys. I'll show you. I've got some bats here to try and tempt you for my live sale that's coming up. So Navajo and chain ply is the same. You know, uh, there's a lot of different variety out there. So um, this is just one way to, to do a Navajo ply. Um, so anyways, there's lots of bats that I'm making for the sale Sunday the 25th at 10.30 a.m. Central Time. I will also be selling my spindles Hopefully I don't dump all of these out. But I've got a very fun bouquet of spindles that will be available all handmade and painted by my farmer friend Barb. Um, you can spin from on a spindle from any type of processed fiber, so or even unprocessed fiber, you could spin from a fleece. Um, bats are my personal favorite because I like how lofty they are. They've got a lot of air in them, so it makes drafting a lot easier. Plus, especially in my bats, I love texture. So you can manipulate the texture to do what you want, basically. Or if you're a newbie, um, the texture kind of works for you because it can kind of hide those flaws and make it look like you did it intentionally. <laughs> um, so that's kind of neat. 
So anyways, I hope that this was helpful and I hope that you all enjoy all the rest of the live videos that are happening this week. There's been some really cool ones um, for Socktober. And uh, I'll be in the comments later answering any other questions and saying hi and everything. So thank you so much for joining me. I'll see you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>